loving the conversation about how cold water immersion doesn't do anything. It's really bad for you, especially if you want adaptation, because it's based on male data. What about recovery? Because you said before you've emphasized or you've pushed the idea that women, when you're not just small men, whereas a lot of the recovery protocols are kind of just kind of adapted from what the science has told us about what is optimal from a male perspective. How do recovery strategies change through a woman's life journey based on the training protocols you've mentioned? Yeah, so when we're looking at recovery itself, we know that women can pretty much hold on to three really, t- really intense days and then they really need to have a couple of days off. I started noticing this anecdotally when I was bike racing and we'd go to a camp and the men and women at the camp and we, as women, would be holding on to the wheels of the men and really trying until about the third day. And then we're like, ugh. And then we'd have a day of being flat or two days of recovery. And then we were off the front and the men were like, eh. So it was this like, okay, what's going on here? So from a physiological perspective, when you start looking at it, Women don't have as much creatine. We have lower creatine storage than men. So that reduces our fast energetic capabilities. We have differences in our neuromuscular firing rate. So we have really um, quick, but we need more recovery for the fast aspects um, and fueling as well, where women won't tap into their liver and muscle glycogen as much as they do their fatty acids and their blood glucose. So we have to be very cognizant that two to three days of really hitting it hard. And then you definitely need to recover for one or two days. If you want to keep going, then you want to go two days on, one day moderate, two days on, one day moderate. For men, it doesn't matter. You can see them go hard for a week and then uh, they crash, they need a day and then they're good to go again. We look at acute recovery modalities. I, I'm loving the conversation about how cold water immersion doesn't do anything. It's really bad for you, especially if you want adaptation is it's based on male data. When we look at female data, because women vasodilate post-exercise, so all their blood goes to the periphery, having cooling mechanisms sends it back centrally so then they can improve their recovery. But for men, their blood goes centrally, and so cooling won't help. We see a negative effect of cooling because their blood is already back centrally. And if you have cold blood coming back centrally, then it really dampens adaptation. But for women, vasodilation, some cooling, shutting it back into central, then we can flush our muscles and everything out after we get out of the cold. So there are different strategies that we have to be aware of. That's a huge fundamental difference between men and women, which I think most people, unless they follow your work, would have no idea about. And I'm guessing this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of extrapolating the data that's been done. The huge amount of sports science data Uh, and nutritional data that has been done predominantly on men, white men specifically. How much do we still have to learn when it comes to dedicating the time and the resource, the energy to looking at how women are adapting? Because that that instance you've highlighted, it's it's almost the polar opposite response that that we, we, we expect or we see in men. It must be incredibly exciting, but also incredibly frustrating that there's a huge amount of data still there to be discovered. Yeah, and... I mean, this is where I get kind of frustrated with sports science as well, because now there's this big call, not enough research. We don't have anything for women. We need to do more research where I'm like, hold on. Yes, of course, in sports science, we see these these systematic reviews that are saying that we need more evidence. There's nothing for women. But if we look outside of sports science into more biomedical stuff, we see molecular aspects that we can incorporate and extrapolate really good information around women. For example, um, like the immune system. So if we look at menstrual cycle effects of the immune system, we see that after ovulation, there's more a pro-inflammatory response. And if we're looking at adaptation, we don't want to put really heavy training loads and reduce recovery after ovulation because there's a systemic inflammatory response that can dampen adaptation. So from a training aspect, we want to look at things that aren't going to invoke systemic inflammation because we already are have that inflammatory response. We see this in um, diabetic research with changes up across the menstrual cycle with the way that we can access carbohydrate, how our bodies respond to it, how our bodies respond to um, intense stress. So there's lots of, of really good, robust information that we can extrapolate from outside of the sports science realm. So I get to a point where I'm like, okay, we look at other 
areas in biomedical science, and they've incorporated women recently, and they're really getting really good data. So support science, come on, stop complaining that there's not enough research for women. Let's do it. And let's pull on some of the research that's already out there so we're not starting from scratch. So it is frustrating, but it's also good to know that we don't have to start from the very, very beginning in basics if we look outside of sports science. Is there a hope that the rapid rise of personalized medicine, personalized training recommendations, personalized nutrition, the whole personalized medical world that is hurtling towards us, could this help you feel to, to leapfrog some of the gaps we have in information? Can we potentially bypass the decades of studies on, on women that's already been done on men by moving more to a personalized approach where everyone can get recommendations based on their DNA, their gut microbiome, all the other information that we're almost at the, the precipice of unlocking? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I mean, it's like things of, you know, there's a big debate about estrogen and progesterone and how they affect the body. We have to look specifically at like estrogen progesterone receptors. How is the body actually responding to the stuff that's being produced? Because we might see someone who is able to build muscle really, really well because they have a higher dose of estrogen, or we might see someone who doesn't build muscle very well and they have the same relative levels of estrogen. It's just that their body doesn't respond to it. So if we do a personalized medicine approach, then we can actually dig in and get really good information, especially sports specificity. So we look at the Olympics. I mean, I love watching it because that is the exact physique and talent that you need to be successful in each of those individual sports. So if we can look at what's happening on that level and then be like, okay, well, you have identified as being a really good long distance runner, but let's look a little bit more at gut microbiome and maybe a little bit more at some of the blood work to see how we can dial in your fueling and your recovery needs because we know X, Y, Z from the professional athletes.